Hello and welcome to the story of cooking. I'm Sarah Nicholas. This show explores people and their unique story of cooking. This will be a historical journey as well as a culinary experience. Each week we're going to look at a different story of cooking and how you can create that in your own kitchen. You don't have to be a four-star chef, but have a love for cooking and an interest in history and you can create your own cooking story in your own kitchen. This week we're going to be looking at Native Americans. We're going to be making three Native American recipes. The first one is Navajo fry bread. Second is Algonquin wild nut soup. And lastly, trout and asparagus. So the first thing we're going to start off with is the Navajo fry bread. It is a dish that is very, very common in the Native American culture. In fact, it's common in many different cultures, not just Native American cultures. A lot of different people have different variations of fry bread. But in a Native American culture, it's actually very, it's a sacred dish. Reason being, um, about 144 years ago, uh, when the government came into Arizona, they forced the Arizona Native Americans off the land to New Mexico to make a 300 mile journey. They weren't able to carry all the staples that they normally would cook with, like the beans and um, some of the heavier items. So the government actually gave them canned goods um, flour, sugar, and lard. You will see that that is most of the ingredients for fry bread. So fry bread was born um, out of this, this movement um, of the Native Americans into New Mexico. So fry bread, especially to Arizona uh, Native Americans, is very sacred and um, looked at as kind of a symbol of unity. So we are going to create that in the kitchen today. Um, first thing we need to do is add our yeast to our water because this dough needs to rise. So we'll do that. It's um, three cups of water and one package of dry yeast. The warm water should dissolve the yeast. You can see it dissolving in the bowl. Once that's dissolved, pretty close to dissolved, you're going to add your salt, uh, one tablespoon of, or I'm sorry, well, yes, one tablespoon of salt and one tablespoon of sugar. And mix, well, we left some behind. And mix all of that together. I'm going to cover that and actually let it sit for a few moments off to the side. All right, the next thing we're going to do is add our dry ingredients because this looks like it's dissolved. All right, we're going to mix six cups of flour with um, oil, two tablespoons of oil. Seems unusual to put oil into the dry ingredients because normally when you're baking, you have your dry ingredients and your wet ingredients and then you incorporate the two. And we just put a wet ingredient and a dry ingredient. Um, I'm not really sure the reason for it, but I, I think, you know, back then they had limited tools and it was just easier to do it this way because you wouldn't want to put your oil in with your yeast. So that's, we're doing it the traditional way. All right. So now we're gonna add our oil and our flour into the yeast mixture without getting it all over myself. All right, and we're gonna knead it. I really like getting messy in the kitchen because I seem to do this every episode. <laughs> okay, so knead it all together till it forms a ball. And this is actually going to have to uh, rise for an hour to an hour and a half before we can fry it. All right, forming a ball. A few more kneads here. I just want it to, to be cohesive. Um, so it's easy to roll out later. Okay, once your ball is formed, we're just going to cover it. Cover it and uh, let it sit for an hour and a half. When we come back, we'll start on our next recipe while this is rising um, with our Algonquin wild nut soup. So now we're back and we have everything set up for our Algonquin wild nut soup. 
The first thing we're gonna do is sweat our shallots. This is a really simple, simple, simple soup. It won't take long to cook and everything's blended at the end and um, strained and it's delicious and creamy. So you want the heat to medium high. We have sliced shallots, three sliced shallots. And you just want those to sweat and get a little golden. It'll take a few minutes. So this, um, when I was thinking about this episode, it was actually inspired by my own personal experience um, on Native American reservations out west. Um, I worked for the federal government for seven years before I decided that I wanted to cook for a living. And um, I got to spend a lot of time, especially in Arizona and New Mexico, ate a lot of fry bread. I never got a chance to eat this particular recipe on the reservations, but it's definitely something they would have eaten back in the day. So just take a few more minutes. You just want to get, you know, sweat them down, get the flavor released, get, some, get a little color on there. Looks like we got some good color and some good flavors going in there, so we're going to add the rest of our ingredients, uh, starting with hazelnuts. Not exactly a wild nut, but it's delicious in this dish. We ground them up, put them into the pot. Then we have five cups of chicken stock. Um, if you can make your own chicken stock, that's great. Um, just, just buy a really good flavorful chicken stock from your grocery store if you can't make your own because Who's got time to make their own chicken stock? But if you do, all the better. Um, we're gonna stir that up. Turn the heat up a little bit so we can actually see that it's cooking. Some salt. You can season it later too if it's not enough. We'll see how it goes. We're gonna add one last ingredient which is a tablespoon and a half of parsley. So it's gonna go for about an hour. I'm going to cover this, let it simmer, and when we come back, we're gonna be making our trout and asparagus. Welcome back. Uh, we have everything set up for our trout and asparagus. Um, I wanna say something though about the asparagus first. This really wouldn't be um, a traditional Native American thing. Um, we would have actually liked to have used uh, fiddleheads, but fiddleheads are seasonal. They only grow in the springtime. So we weren't able to get fiddleheads, but again, we have asparagus, which tastes sort of similar. Um, but I'm gonna tell you about fiddleheads anyway, just because Native Americans on the East Coast would have picked fiddleheads and eaten fiddleheads as part of their diet. Um, a lot of people don't know what fiddleheads are. They're actually a pretty uncommon ingredient. In fact, when I asked my husband last night what a fiddlehead was, he thought it was a fish. So I think most people probably don't know what fiddleheads are. You actually may have seen them even though you haven't eaten them before because they're kind of popular in floral arrangements. They kind of look like twirly little worms, so they look good in a floral arrangement. So you may have seen them even though you have not eaten them. Um, they grow again in the springtime and they're actually part of the fern family. They're called fiddleheads. Uh, they grow on the ostrich fern. An ostrich fern actually grows to be about six feet tall, but the actual fawn, the fiddlehead, is only about you know, this big and it, it looks like a, almost like a cinnamon bun, swirly and green, um, green looking, so worm-like, cinnamon bun-like. Um, all ferns are not edible though, so if you see them growing in the wild, do not eat a fern because you see a fern, they only eat the fiddleheads off the fern and ostrich ferns happen to be edible. Um, they have a very crunchy texture, much like asparagus, um, when they're raw, they're very sweet. Um, and somewhat starchy, also like asparagus. From being that Native Americans got their food from the wild, um, they w discovered fiddleheads and discovered it was a nutritious and delicious way to get greens into their um, kids' bodies, just like we try to force uh, broccoli down our kids' throats nowadays. Um, I like to think of Native Americans as like the first foodies, such a popular term nowadays, but Native Americans were brave. They tried stuff that they found growing in the wild. They're very experimental with their food and um, consequently came out with a lot of great things that we appreciate and cook with today. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to take the asparagus that's been cleaned um, and the tough parts of the bottom removed and I'm just gonna blanch it in salted boiling water. Just a 
soften it up a little bit. This will actually be sauteed with the trout. So let that go for a few minutes. And then once it's softened a little bit in the boiling water, um, we're going to blanch it in cold water just so it keeps that green color. So now we're gonna start with our trout. Uh, traditionally, you would have cooked trout in a cast iron skillet. Um, my granddaddy uh, always took us camping and we'd go fishing and we'd catch trout if we were lucky. He would catch trout. Um, he was always lucky, I never was, I was a terrible fisherman. But he would always cook in a cast iron skillet over the campfire. So um, that's the way I would have traditionally done it. Um, Native Americans may have traditionally done it or even over an open spit. So we're gonna do it this way. This way is just as good. All right, so we're gonna start um, the trout with four strips of bacon. All right. Get all that bacon fat in the bottom of the pan, helps us cook the trout later. And actually, while that's cooking a little bit, it looks like our asparagus is done. We have a water bath over here to shock the asparagus. Cold water bath. See how pretty green it stays when you put it in cold water? All right. Set this aside. All right, so the bacon, you just need it to crisp up and cook so you can, you can crumble it later. It's gonna go into our pan after we've cooked the fish in the bacon grease. So my, um, I talked a little bit about my granddad earlier. He actually spent a lot of time on uh, Native American uh, reservations in the Southwest. In fact, the necklace I'm wearing right now um, came from him and my great uncle Douglas. They were brothers. And uh, after World War II, they both came back from World War II and decided that they were gonna take a trip out west and explore the Southwest, Arizona, New Mexico. And they bought this um, from a local Navajo artisan that they came upon on the side of the road. So I wore this today in honor of that. And he always talked about fry bread too. Um, we used to do fry bread on our camping trips in a cast iron skillet, of course. There's a theme here, a lot of cast iron skillets and a lot of fat. <laughs> Can't go wrong with that though. All right, let's just flip the bacon. Try not to burn yourself. Just want it crispy on both sides. Okay. Needs a couple more minutes. So it looks like our bacon is done nice and crispy. The fat rendered off that we can use to cook our trout. Just put that on a paper towel. Some of the grease drain off a little bit. Turn down our pan a little bit. All right, set this aside. Okay, so now for our trout. We have cleaned trout. Um, skin off, scales, bones, all gone. Uh, we're just going to dredge it in some flour. And you don't want to, you don't want a lot of, you, you don't want this to be like a fried chicken where there's a lot of crust. You just want it um, lightly dredged and you can even hit the excess off. You don't want it too covered, just like this. Just a nice sheen. All right, drop that into the pan. I think we can do a couple. Shake, shake, shake. It's dancing. Okay. Let's do one more. All right. And it won't take very long, um, especially these fish. White fish cooks pretty fast. Um, trout cooks pretty fast, and they're cut really thinly. So maybe a couple minutes on each side. But that bacon fat should make it nice and golden and. Uh, crispy and delicious. So I talked a little bit earlier about um, some of the stuff we got from uh, Native Americans. Uh, one of the things that I'm most appreciative that we got from Native Americans is seafood. Uh, they also were very adventurous in what seafood they tried, especially on the East Coast. So a lot of things we eat today like oysters, mussels, periwinkles, 
gooey duck all came from the Native Americans because, again, they were the ones brave enough to try it. Okay. Let's turn this up a little bit. It's nice to take a peek. Got a little ways to go. Isn't that bacon fat beautiful, though? There's nothing better than bacon fat. So we're just going to check them to see if they're ready. Looks like they are, so gently flip them. See, it's got that nice golden brown. That one could have gone a little longer, but that's okay. Let them go the same on the other side till they're cooked through. Okay, so those look pretty good. Again, fish cooks very fast. Um, when they start to flake when you touch them, you know they're cooked all the way through. Again, they should not take more than a, a few minutes per side, depending on how hot your pan is. This pan's pretty hot, and the bacon also helps it. Actually, they look like they're pretty good. So we're just going to uh, set those aside one more time. And toss in our other ingredients. All right, I know this seems very gluttonous, but you're going to add butter. Trust me, it helps. <laughs> All right, and then we are going to add our asparagus back in to the pan. I'm gonna to try to get as much water off of the asparagus as possible, because it will sizzle when there's water. Now again, you can do this with fiddleheads. Same concept, do exactly the same thing. Boil your fiddleheads, um, put them in cold water, drain them, bring them back to the pan and saute them in butter and bacon, bacon fat. Same process, just different ingredient. All right, let those go for a few moments. Toss them around. I like my asparagus a little crispy, like crunchy. Um, I don't like it to be mushy and dissolve. Um, so you can cook them as long as your family likes them, but I like them to hold their shape and I like them to be crispy and crunchy when I bite into them. I think they taste better, and I think there's more flavor left in them if you don't cook them to death, which is always good. All right, put our trout back in. Season it up a little bit with some salt. Depending on how much salt you like, you don't have to put a lot. Um, and just let that go for a few more minutes. I mean, your fish is already cooked. You just want to kind of blend the flavors together, and that's it. That's as simple as it is. It's, you know, it's just three easy ingredients. Asparagus, trout, fat, your bacon, and your um, butter. Oh, I almost forgot. One of the best ingredients, the bacon. So you want to crumble the bacon over top. That's right, more bacon. Always more bacon. Always more butter and more bacon. So there you go, we've got our trout, our asparagus, and our bacon all cooking up in the pan. It looks perfect. When we come back, we're gonna finish our Navajo fry bread and our Algonquin wild nut soup. Hi, we're back. We're gonna finish our Navajo fry bread and our Algonquin wild nut soup. We're gonna start with the fry bread. It's been rising for an hour, a little over an hour, um, but it looks good. I don't know if you remember what it looked like before, but it is definitely probably more than doubled in size, which is perfect. Um, so what we're gonna do, really simple. Grab a handful, pat it out. So about five to seven inches in diameter. Um, doesn't have to be exact. It just, doesn't even have to be pretty. It's gonna be good regardless. Um, but yeah, about five to seven inches in diameter, little discs. And then we're just gonna drop it straight into the oil. Make sure your oil is 350 degrees because it needs to be high heat. These things cook fast and they won't puff up and look like fry bread unless the heat's really hot. All right, there we go. Do another one. They don't take long. I just want them to brown up. See how it's, it's puffing? The air bubbles are getting in there. It's because the heat was really hot. All 
right? Same thing, five to seven inches diameter. Drop it in. Okay. You don't necessarily have to flip it, but I can just show you how puffy it's getting. It'll just take about 30 seconds or so. Set this over here. It'll make a lot too. Get a lot of fry bread out of one, one recipe. Let's see what the other one looks like. All right, just let that keep going. And again, um, you know, you can serve anything with this. A lot of people nowadays eat it as a taco. It'll be like the taco bottom shell like thing. And then they put guacamole or whatever else they want on top of it. And the Native Americans would have eaten it just like this. So if you recall, it was not that thick before, so it's, it's all full of air puffed up in there. So that's it. That's your fry bread. So we're going to go ahead and start on the soup. Last step with the soup. I told you the soup was easy. You're going to see in two seconds how easy. Um, we're going to take a blender and ladle the soup into the blender. I would try to dump it, but... That might be a disaster. Actually, I'm going to risk it. Be very careful, though. I mean, this soup's been on the stove for an hour. So it is hot. But I succeeded. OK. All right, put the soup back on the blender. Put your top on, make sure the soup doesn't go everywhere. Extra safety measure, put a towel over the top. And turn it on and just blend it. I'm going to blend it till it's pretty smooth. It shouldn't take too long because everything's kind of soft because it's been cooking for an hour. All right, that looks good. Turn it off before you take the top off. <laughs> I've also been guilty of that as well. Just get so excited about food. Okay, now we're going to strain it back into our pot. And what we're doing this for is because we want the soup to be smooth. And there's obviously still particles in there. So we want to make sure all of those are left in the sieve, not in the soup. All right. Sometimes it gets a little stuck. You can just take a wooden spoon, stir it around. See it's coming out the bottom. Nice and clear and smooth. It smells delicious hazelnuts and onions. I'm going to finish straining this and I'm going to clean up and when we come back we're going to have all three dishes plated. Welcome back. We have all three dishes plated. We have our Navajo fry bread, fried crispy golden brown. We have our Algonquin wild nut soup. Doesn't look very appetizing because of the color but trust me it's delicious. And lastly we have our trout and asparagus covered in bacon fat and bacon. Absolutely gorgeous, delicious dish. So thank you for joining me on this chapter of the story of cooking. I'm Sarah Nicholas. See you next time.